As our president, Christine Lagarde, said in the March press conference, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a watershed moment for Europe. The war is first and foremost a tragedy for people, for those who have lost their lives in the violence and for the millions fleeing it. Beyond the suffering and the devastating humanitarian consequences, the conflict also has an economic impact. And we're feeling that here in the Euro area too. In this episode, we're going to look at what the war means for our economy. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined by Joao Souza, who is a senior manager in our economics department. Joao, welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you here today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Now, before we start, I think it's worth mentioning that things are very fluid at the moment. We're sitting here recording on the 22nd of March, and there's really a high chance that a lot will have changed even by the time we go out with this episode. I suppose uncertainty really is the best way to describe the situation. That's why in today's conversation, we'll focus on the effect the war is already having on different aspects of our economy, things like prices and growth. Joao, let's start off by talking about where we're coming from, so how the euro area economy was faring before the war started. Before the war started, the euro area was in a relatively favorable position. So we were recovering from the pandemic, which uh, we weathered better than what is expected initially, also mm. thanks to a, to a very significant uh, policy support. And we were starting, as, as the, the containment measures were starting to be lifted, to see some, some growth recovery appearing. Uh, and uh, we are we're seeing uh, underlying conditions for the Euro area economy uh, gradually in, improving, uh, in spite of, of course, some headwinds that we were expecting in the last quarter of last year and the beginning of this year linked to the Omicron wave, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, we have seen that were not so severe as we, we, we were expected, also thanks to the vaccination campaigns. Uh, and therefore, the Euro area economy was um, on a and a good path to, to a strong recovery in 2022, uh, and in particular uh, from the second quarter uh, of this year, as also further the containment measures will be relaxed uh, further. There are a few issues, headwinds as you call them, but in general it, we were on a good path. Yes, we were on a good path. We returned to the pre-crisis level already uh, at the end of last year. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, and, and very importantly, we had a, a strong labor market and unemployment rate has been con- continued to, to go down uh, and, and is quite uh, low for historical standards. Unemployment growth has also continued to be positive. Uh, and um, overall, the external environment up to the war was also uh, favorable and even a little bit more favorable than we were expecting by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So all this uh, gave us some confidence that this year we would have a a good recovery from the pandemic. Okay, let's turn to look at where things are today and how Russia's war in Ukraine is linked to our economy here in the euro area. Joao, you are in charge of what we call the macroeconomic projections. Now, they're basically forecasts that aim to predict and, and understand the future state of our economy. And they look at things like economic growth, inflation, wages, trade, things like that. We publish them four times a year. Uh, twice they're carried out by ECB colleagues. And the other two times we work together with economists across the national central banks in the Eurozone. So all of the countries that, that have the Euro. And our close watchers know them as, as staff projections. Now. As part of your latest projections, which came out just a couple of weeks ago, you looked at how the war is affecting the economy. And in that, you identified three ways or channels, if you will, through which it can have an impact or it is having an impact. Number one, trade. Number two, commodities. So that's things like raw materials like oil, gas, food. 
And number three, something that we call confidence. Um, Joao, let's start with trade. Before I start with trade, I, I like to mention that, of course, this was a very challenging exercise. Uh, and as also we mentioned, this was the first, the forecast contained a first assessment of the, of the crisis. Uh, and they were basically closed on the 2nd of March uh, with technical assumptions that uh, of 28th of February. So oil prices of 28th of February and gas prices around that time. So that's a very short time period after the war starting. A, sh a short time period uh, after the war, war started uh, with, of course, uh, uh, still very imperfect uh, information. Now, uh, let me start then to uh, answer your question on the trade. Uh, of course, trade with RC is going to be affected first by the bans on imports and, and, and exports, and also the, the exclusion of Russian banks from SWIFT should also uh, make the financing of trade for Russian firms uh, more difficult, which should have an impact on the uh, Russian exports to, to, to the euro area. But I'd like to mention that the direct trade with Russia is a relatively small share of the euro area foreign demand, it's only 3%. However, um, even though the, the size is small, there are the other channels that can be more important, and, uh, and I'd like to mention some of these. So, so first of all, uh, Central and Eastern European countries are, have closer ties with, with Russia, and they will be uh, more affected uh, directly by Russia, which would also affect us because they're important trade partners of, of the euro area. So second, supply constraints, su supply chains could, could be affected by, by the war because, the, first of all, the war can disrupt logistics and transportation, also because of the uh, flight and shipping banks, uh, bans and in the factory region and, and supply chain disruptions. Uh, and in addition, both Russia and UK are important producers of critical raw materials. Uh, and this um, implies that um, uh, this could create some problems in global value chains uh, that would uh, worsen the supply bottlenecks that we have were expecting that were, would be improving this year. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Russia uh, is a, a, an important exporter of palladium uh, used in catalytic converters. Uh, Ukraine uh, is an important exporter of neon gas used in semiconductors. Uh, and so this, um, this the war is likely to exacerbate some of these supply bottlenecks uh, and cause further disturbances in, in terms of the supply constraints with some consequences for, for inflation. Now, this what we have seen so far is that indeed we already seen some signs that trade is weaker since the onset of the conflict. Uh, and of course, this will affect uh, euro area exports. And this will be the, the first channel. Of course, also the Russian economy is expected to, to go into recession this year. Uh, and that by itself will also further reduce the, the external trade of the euro area. So even though the direct trade between the euro area and Russia is not that large, there are all these kind of knock-on effects that will lead uh, to it having an, an impact on, on the euro area economy. Exactly, and of course one of the difficulties is to try to identify where s these bottlenecks may occur, and maybe sometimes uh, it can be a small share of the market or a critical raw material, but they could create a much greater disturbance. That brings us on to the second channel, in fact, um, commodities. So, as I said before, it's kind of raw materials such as oil, gas and food. And um, that's a topic that we've actually heard a lot about in, in the recent weeks. Can you talk us through this channel a little bit? Besides the, the, the foods that I, I just mentioned, these critical raw materials, of course, one of the main issues relates to the fact that Russia is a euro area main energy provider accounting for 20% of the oil and 35% of its gas in 2020. And uh, the importance of these commodities in, for the euro area, uh, we can expect significant perturbations in these markets, uh, even if there's no ban uh, on Russian oil uh, in, in the euro area, so consumers will be reluctant to buy it. Also, some firms are not buying any more uh, Russian uh, oil or, or, or gas. Uh, and there's also less willingness to finance and insure transactions uh, with Russian commodities. So, of course, it's clear that this is going to cause a perturbation in the energy market. 
which uh, is implying already a significant increase in, in the prices of oil and, and, and gas, which actually was already going on before the war, but of course now has, has really uh, surged since the, the start of, of, of the war. And that's something that I think it's fair to say we're all feeling this, this rise in, in energy prices. And it brings me on to the last channel, um, which is confidence. I think it's fair to say that we're all shaken by what we hear and what we see and what we read about the war every day. And there is a lot of fear and uncertainty um, about what will happen next. When economists talk about confidence and the effect on economic activity, what exactly is meant here? So how are we seeing the war impacting the economy through through this confidence channel? Indeed, the war, given it is so close to, to the euro area, and uh, given the, all the, the possible rec- the ramifications of the conflict, uh, has a clear impact on the confidence of, of, of households. And uh, given also this very important impact on energy prices, it further worsens that impact. Uh, so in terms of the of how the economists look at this. Uh, so one, one way that um, we take into account is that uh, these, uh, for instance, these large energy shocks lead to uh, precautionary behavior of households because energy is, of course, a, an essential good uh, and uh, makes people become more cautious and, and save more, in particular those that can, but of course those that have less savings uh, will be forced to um, restrict their consumption uh, expenditure. And of course, the war uh, will add uh, with that to this, and also uh, the war has created a, a large perturbation in, in financial markets, a, a lot of uncertainty, uh, and this has created, on one hand, uh, when there's a lot of uncertainty, the financial market uh, participants increase what we call the risk premium, so they they will demand uh, higher rates for for lending money, uh, and this will cost will worsen the, the financial financial conditions of firms. Because it's harder for them to get money to, to invest? It's harder for them to get money to invest because uh, the situation is more uncertain. So who is lending the money will, of course, uh, demand a higher rate yep. to compensate for the higher risk. Uh, on top of that, of course, also all this uncertainty on what will happen in terms of the war makes firms naturally more cautious in their behavior and this uh, depresses investment. Let's zoom in a bit to talk about something that we've already touched upon, prices. And indeed, that's our main task here at the ECB, achieving stable prices. Now, already before the war, inflation was higher than in previous years. And energy has been a big topic here. Now, it is worth mentioning that energy prices are what we call volatile, so they are always changing a lot. Joao, how are the recent energy price increases different to what we usually see? And how much of that is down to the war in Ukraine? Energy prices, uh, as I mentioned also before, started increasing uh, more forcefully around mid 2021s. So n- not all of the of the increase uh, is uh, to the war, uh, even though of course we have seen that uh, already f- from from the end of, of, of last year, uh, say from September onwards, we've seen seen a very sharp rise in in, in the prices of, of gas that is relevant for the euro area, and and this is reflects mainly geopolitical tensions uh, with with Russia. Uh, part of it is linked to the reopening of the economy last year after COVID, which of course led to a strong uh, increase in, in demand and supply uh, was was catching up. Uh, and this has uh, exacerbated uh, the recovery in, in, in oil prices, which would, we would be expecting some recovery because the, the economy before was... was very depressed because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, uh, these geopolitical tensions added a much stronger momentum and the specific circumstances of gas in the euro area were very important. And this was something that um, gas, traditionally, gas prices tended to follow oil prices. But in this case, there was a very strong decoupling uh, that was uh, a bit of a surprise in the, in, in the end of last year. 
uh, and of course explains why uh, inflation uh, was much higher than expected uh, uh, at the end of last year and beginning of, of this year. Now, uh, the war has, of course, uh, amplified all this, uh, and uh, energy prices, uh, oil reached almost $140, uh, which is a very, very high price, uh, and, uh, and gas prices has also surged. Uh, and, and this, of course, creates a, a very important shock to the euro area economy, uh, driving inflation up. So, as you've said, energy is is obviously making up a big part of this rise in inflation. But is there anything else driving it? I I know you mentioned food prices earlier, for example. We have seen that uh, food prices are also pushing up uh, uh, inflation and they they have uh, also increased substantially and and they are growing at around 4%. uh, So the HICP component is growing around 4% in February, where the average is around 2%. Uh, And we see here also uh, on food, uh, also the indirect effect of energy uh, and also uh, via, via transport costs and also the, the, the energy that is needed to produce the food uh, and also via per- fertilizer prices, which of course also depend uh, very much on, on, on energy. It all has a knock-on effect, doesn't it? It's not just, not just that the food isn't there, it's, it's all the things that go into growing that food as well. Exactly, and of course, with with the war in Ukraine, this effect is going to be become worse. Yeah. A- and on top of that, uh, of course, we have the the situation relating wheat, which of course the prices in international markets have grown, uh, have surged uh, since the, the the invasion. But I'd like to to mention that uh, the energy component uh, is important not just for the headline inflation, but also is important and, and sometimes. Uh, this is a bit overlooked, is also important from the, for the core component. The core so is, is the inflation where we, we take out the energy and food prices so that those volatile prices. Exactly. Uh, because energy is such an important input into the production of mo- most goods and, and services, um, when you have uh, increases in, in energy prices like you had uh, last year and the beginning of this year, uh, this will start to feed through to the other components. Uh, I mean, of course, on, on, on processed food, it's very easy to think about that. If you, if you bake a bread, you need to use uh, heat, uh, and that uh, will <laughs> imply that the costs will go up. It's energy, uh, yeah. It's energy. Uh, so, but the cost of cars, if you think transportation, tourism, all that will, will, is affected by increased energy. Uh, and so when you have these very large shocks, uh, you get to a point where the firms cannot fully accommodate all the all the shock and pass through some of this increase into the consumers. Uh, and we have, in terms of our estimations, we think that a large part of uh, or significant part of the of the increase in core inflation is also due to energy, uh, and is also contributing to. Uh, increase this component, which now in Serie was 2.7 percent, still, of course, m- much lower than, than, than headline, which was around 5.9, but uh, is reflecting uh, also uh, these uh, indirect effects, what we call indirect effects uh, from energy. Well, that brings me on to the, the next part of, of our discussion, of our conversation. And I want to think about what this all means and how we see the euro area economy faring in the future as a result of those effects that you've just mentioned. Now, we've already said that there is a lot of uncertainty as to what will happen. The EU has already announced its fourth sanctions package in the space of one month. Discussions and negotiations are still continuing. And of course, we all hope that the horror will be over soon. On the ECB side, President Lagarde has repeatedly confirmed that we're carefully monitoring developments and will take whatever action is needed to secure price stability and safeguard financial stability. So this was a very challenging environment to to have to forecast what's going to happen with the euro area economy. And in the last set of projections, you came up with two additional scenarios to the usual projections. Could you talk a bit about those two additional scenarios? 
Uh, indeed, the, the outlook is very uncertain and, and depends crucially on how the war unfolds, the impact of the current sections and what other measures may come also from, from the governments. Uh, of course, uh, for, for an economist, uh, we have to be humble in this situation because because when, when we are living in a, in a very high uncertainty uh, environment, uh, we also have to to be humbled uh, in terms of, of the abilities that we have in forecasting the future of the economy. So our usual projections are, are quite detailed and, and, and are quite a heavy exercise. Uh, and of course, when reality is changing so quickly, as we saw now uh, in, in the war and also as we saw uh, during COVID, uh, we have to resort to, to scenarios that let us try to map the, the, the level of uncertainty that we see. Uh, and, and, and this was the case uh, in, in this exercise uh, where we have uh, considered uh, one adverse scenario and one severe scenario. Basically, the, the, the adverse scenario implies stricter sanctions to, the, to Russia um, on than, than we had foreseen in the baseline, leading to disruptions in global value chains. Uh, we, had, we also assumed that there would be some gas supply uh, shortages that would create uh, higher energy costs and, and cuts in the oil production mm -hmm. uh, and uh, assumed also some uh, increase in risk premium financial markets. Uh, this uh, would imply a, a significantly lower uh, growth this year by 1.2 percentage points and uh, higher inflation by 0 0.8 percentage points also this year compared to the baseline. So we would see uh, the typical uh, supply shock uh, reaction of lower growth and uh, higher inflation. Still, uh, we would still see positive growth uh, this year. For the years uh, ahead in this adverse scenario for 23 and 24, we don't have major revisions to, to the baseline. Uh, and this is because of the assumption that we make that the, the conflict would be resolved over time and most of the detrimental effects of the war would be felt in 2022, which is an important assumption that we also uh, assume for, for the severe scenario. And then they would fade out in 23 and 24. And it would fade out in 23 and 24, even though the sanctions would remain until the end of the projection mm -hmm. uh, horizon. Now, in a severe scenario, we would assume harsher cuts in, in energy supply, higher commodity prices, uh, and higher reaction of the economy to that. Uh, and also we assumed what we call uh, second round effects, so, so inflation will be persistently higher. So, so basically it means that wages would uh, grow more strongly because of the high inflation numbers, and this would result in high inflation and more persistent uh, inflation process. That's when people negotiate higher wages because of the inflation and exactly. it kind of... Um, uh, entrenches the, itself. Uh, and that, of course, increases, increases the cost of firms, and then they will have to pass through those costs into higher prices, mm -hmm. and we have some wage price uh, reinforcing mechanism that would lead to higher inflation in the future. So in this scenario, inflation will be 7.1% in 2022 and 2.7% 2 in 2023. Uh, but in, in, in the severe scenario, in 2024, we would go back to the baseline level of 1.9%. Mm -hmm. And this is also true for, for the adverse scenario. So over the medium term, inflation always uh, goes back to levels closer to, to our target or, or somewhat below in the adverse scenario. So when the economy is hit, uh, over time, in the medium term, this contextual effect leads to lower demand, which would... Uh, imply that inflation would gradually uh, normalize. Uh, of course, in these scenarios, we have also the, the assumption that uh, energy prices also over time start normalizing after the, the serious shock this year. Yeah. But to, in, to some extent, uh, I think it's important to note that when you think about the impact of commodity prices on inflation, uh, these prices, this, this impact is at the moment is a level effect. So there's a big increase in, in energy, but we would need the, that energy would keep increasing at, at the very same high rate, rates yeah. to produce uh, more sustained inflation. Uh, but of course, um, this scenario assumed that uh, the, the, the energy markets would uh, gradually normalize and also assumes that uh, if there are any uh, energy supply shortages over time, this would be replaced by other sources and, and, and production will, will, will recover.
but but it's important to 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 retain that the the, the shock is is contextual is is not is a sub supply supply shock uh, it affects confidence it affects uh, has detrimental impact on the economy uh, and uh, we assume that also creates some 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 unemployment in, in the short term uh, but over the medium term also considering uh, the, the the euro area has those elements of resilience that I mentioned, so favorable labor markets. Uh, uh, we were recovering from the pandemic and 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 the accumulated savings. Uh, we expect the the euro area, even in these more severe scenarios, to weather these 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 shocks uh, with positive growth rates. Joao, before we wrap up, we ask all our guests on the podcast for something they would recommend to our listeners who'd like to learn more about the topics that we've been discussing today. Of course, we are living in a, in a very uncertain, uncertain world. And uh, I, I can recall a, a speech by Ben Bernanke in, in October 2007, where he talks about the, the implications of uncertainty for monetary policy. Uh, and of course, he concludes that uh, when faced with high uncertainty like we have now, we have to be humble with our forecasts and also with our ability to forecast the future course of the economy. This I I implies that we need to continue to work on scenarios. We need to continue to develop this and monitor the situation and, and update them uh, to try to, to map all the possible outcomes that we can have from this very, from this dreadful war. Uh, and uh, provide the best advice to, to the governing council on how best to, 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 to react. Uh, but indeed, in the euro area since, the, the, say, 2007, we have been through a lot of crises. So we have been, after the global financial crisis, we have the sovereign debt crisis, we have the COVID uh, pandemic, and, and now we have the war. Uh, and I think we, we have been developing over time, not just DCB, but also at uh, EU level, a lot of instruments that uh, allows us to deal with uh, shocks of ever greater magnitude. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, this will also happen now. And, uh, and because we have learned a lot how to deal with crises, we are better able to, to see the all vulnerabilities also in a still uh, building uh, monetary union. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure that this will also be, be the case now. Well, I think the best we can hope for is that the war is soon resolved in a peaceful way, um, putting an end to the violence and, and trauma for, for all those suffering from it. Joao, thank you very much for being here with us today and for breaking down this very important topic for us. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Check out the show notes for further reading on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.